Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome on behalf of the Amsterdam International Water Web. On this, uh, with this seminar, the first of a series of four, it's called Clean Water and Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, my name is Bart Krul. I'm Public Affairs Advisor at Waternet, the water utility company in the Amsterdam region and a moderator for this event. Really looking forward uh, to this program we have uh, that lasts until a quarter past four. Before I tell you a bit more about the program we have in store for you, I'd like to uh, start off with some practical stuff. Um, quite sure everybody's well aware of uh, all the practical stuff because we're all on, in this uh, online meetings all the time and, uh, and on webinars. But just to make sure, please turn off your microphone and uh, your camera. And uh, there's the opportunity to uh, pose your questions in the chat. And there's two specific moments uh, we have uh, identified later on this webinar. And then we will select a few questions for our panelists. Um, if you'd like to share some content via social media, please use the hashtag or the mention that is mentioned uh, on the left lower side of, uh, of uh, not on this slide, but on other slides. And this webinar is being recorded for, uh, well, the obvious uh, sharing purposes within the AIWW community. So these are the practical uh, things. Um, well, as I said, this webinar is the first in a series of four leading towards the uh, Amsterdam International Water Week that will take place uh, from 1 till 5 uh, November. These are the four we have in store for you. And um, this one today is about clean water and ecosystem restoration. Um, and um, uh, let's take a look. The program today is uh, uh, centered around... Um, uh, uh, here we have it. That's me starting off. There's uh, the program today centered about around the question, how do we ensure ecosystem balance in watersheds? And it is divided in two parts. The first part is about standards and perspectives. What standards are necessary to uh, ensure that uh, a balanced ecosystem? And we will introduce um, the perspectives from the European Commission and from three rivers, the Meuse, the Seine River and the Senegal River. Uh, and uh, well, the official introductions, I will do them later of the high level speakers we have uh, when they are about to take the stage. The second part is all about um, challenges and good practices and that will introduce the ecological and the technological perspective by Stuart and by Eric. And for them goes as well, the introduction will be done later. And I'd like to, uh, I just forgot to say that uh, the the Amsterdam International Water Week will take place from 1 to 5 November with as a central theme, the blue-green deals with integrated solutions. So please check that, uh, have that uh, circled in your agenda. Uh, but for now, we have the webinar, um, Water Solutions, number one, clean water and ecosystem restoration. And just for us to have an uh, idea of who's joining us, we are quite happy with the amount of uh, uh, subscriptions and uh, attendees uh, for this afternoon. We have uh, one question to give us some idea of who is uh, attending this webinar. So if you please would like to answer the following question, the IWW has a focus on three target groups, city, utility, and industry. And to what group do you belong? Of course, the other is quite um, relevant as well. And the first three obviously are our target groups. It gives us a bit of an idea of who's joining us. And it's also interesting for our speakers to know what audience is in front of them in this online webinar. Well, we have 72% voted, 42 people, uh, well, city, 7%, utility, 12, industry, 5 or 4%, and main is other. We don't have the time to go into all these uh, uh, the more details about who other is, but it gives us an idea of who's joining us. So thanks a lot for uh, uh, answering this question. And um, well, I'd like to get on with our program. As I said, part one, standards and perspectives. I'd like to introduce the European Commission perspective brought to us by Hans Stielstra. He's deputy head of clean water unit at the European Commission. He's worked there since 19, 
98 and presently he's acting head of the unit for global sustainability trade and multilateral environmental agreements and he will tell us all about the water framework directive so hans um can you tell us more about that uh, directive please I, i'm i'm sure i can watch the uh, echo is gone uh, Okay, I will put the volume very low here, so hopefully there is very little uh, in the way of echo. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I, um, I I work in a lead for the European Commission for the uh, unit that is responsible for the Water Framework Directive. And um, you read out my old job title, but uh, I'm no longer in the uh, in uh, on the international side of the environment. But it doesn't really matter. I now. Uh, since a few years in charge of this uh, issue of the Water Framework Directive. So if I can, if you uh, show the next slide, please. Um, I saw in the program that I have five minutes, so I will be super fast and succinct. Um, Water Framework Directive since 2000 sets out the um, um, the standards that have to be fulfilled by uh, essentially all water in Europe, all fresh water in Europe, that is groundwater, um, all surface waters, and also coastal waters. Um, and they also, the, the directive also covers all possible impacts on water. So it's classical pollution from um, uh, cities, it is from agriculture, it is uh, uh, from industry, but it's also pollution, uh, legacy pollution, so pollution of many years ago, or it is uh, even uh, changes to water bodies that affect somehow the quality of water. So think of dams or um, dams and weirs and whatever sort of human made obstacle we have. So that's all covered by this directive. The objectives are, are, are two really. On the one hand, since 2003, it is prohibited any deterioration in quality of water. Um, that is an extremely powerful uh, tool, if you like. So it really means that uh, any activity that has an impact on water at the moment will have to go through a permitting procedure so uh, before it can be allowed. And, and in principle, uh, no negative impact on water bodies can be allowed anymore, say, for the last 18 years. Um, so that's a, a very strong, very powerful uh, tool that, uh, that we collectively have. And then the second objective is to put everything, all water bodies in Europe, and there's about, well, there's one million kilometers of rivers, for instance. Um, they all have to be put into good status. Um, and, and I will get to what good status is uh, in a moment. The tools that we have is that member states every six years need to draw up a plan in which they indicate how they think they will be achieving those objectives and uh, all the measures that, that come with it. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows you where we are at the moment uh, on two aspects of water quality. On the left hand side, you see how member states are performing in terms of the water framework directive and red means bad and blue means good. So you see that uh, there are a lot of good, good water bodies or water bodies usually in a good status in the north of Europe, in Scotland, in Scandinavia, uh, in the north of Spain, in the east of, uh, in the southeast of Europe. Um, and that the majority of water bodies in the northern part of Europe or the northwestern part of Europe, the central part of Europe, Italy, uh, are not in good status. And, for Europe as a whole, uh, that is less than half at the moment. And we are well beyond uh, the, the, the timeline indicated in the directive. So there's really still a lot of work that, that has to be done. Now, I have to say we measure water quality in a rather complicated way, which means that all water bodies need to fulfill certain chemical standards, physiochemical standards like temperature, um, and also hydromorphological standards. And 
if only one of them is not of sufficient quality, the entire uh, water body is of insufficient quality. So it's a very severe standard, you could say. On the right hand side, I've shown the picture for urban wastewater in Europe, uh, where blue again is good and red is bad. Um, and this means that, uh, as you can see, a number of countries, even though the, the the specific directive that is responsible for this or that governs this is already 30 years old. A number of countries still are not sufficiently equipped to deal with urban wastewater. My next slide is also my last slide. Um, we have spent uh, a few years evaluating all this legislation and we have come to the conclusion that overall we think that this legislation is fit for purpose. Um, which, as I showed on the previous slide, doesn't mean that we are in a perfect situation, far from it. I mean, there's still a lot to be improved, uh, but we don't think that the problem is with the legislation as such. We will do some smaller changes to the legislation in the years to come. We will probably strengthen somewhat the uh, urban wastewater treatment directive, so the one that deals with wastewater from cities. Um, we will not be changing the water framework directive so much, but we will be looking at the chemical substances. Why? Because uh, over the last years there have been new substances. Uh, the, the, for instance, in the Netherlands, there's discussion on, on PFAS, uh, but there's also microplastics. Um, so there are some pressures, some substances that are clearly problematic. Um, that we are not yet regulating, so we want to in include them. Um, but more important, I think, to emphasize here is that uh, in order to achieve these very ambitious targets that I mentioned in the beginning, what needs to happen is we need to have far more investment in water management and nature restoration. Uh, we need member states to apply the rules more strictly um, and we also from the European side we will uh, certainly uh, keep a close eye on that. Um, we need to do some simpl simplification in our legislation but the most important one I think to mention here is the need to make sure that other policy areas also consider water as a central consideration. So uh, very simple, take the example of agriculture. We know that agriculture exerts huge pressure still on uh, water quality uh, or the energy production with, uh, with a number of electricity, uh, well, for instance, the electricity production uh, in the old fashioned way, shall we say, with gas and oil and coal leads to the heating of, uh, of water bodies. Uh, or the production of electricity with hydropower leads to blocking uh, water bodies. So energy, you see, is, is a very important uh, pressure also on water. And we need to make sure over the years to come that those water considerations actually make an intrinsic and part of, um, of those policy areas. So a lot of work still to be done in order to, uh, before we can be confident that we will achieve the, the objectives that I set out in the beginning. Yeah, Thank you very lot, much, uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Yes, cheers, thanks a lot. Um, indeed, your a muses. very quick and sh short introduction from your part. There will be, there will follow three more perspectives uh, coming from Rivers. And after that, there's uh, room for discussion uh, between the four uh, uh, panelists that we have seen then. So uh, then Hans, for you, there's more time uh, to share your insights if you want. And uh, for you uh, um, as um, audience, please make sure you Pose your questions via the chat so we can also in that discussion uh, see what uh, questions we can uh, select. Uh, then I'd like to introduce Liam Poa. She's the founder of Drinkable Rivers. Uh, she's working uh, towards a world of drinkable rivers, uh, well, around the world. Uh, she started uh, walking in 2018, spent 60 days walking the length of the Meuse River, and that's why she's introducing uh, that particular perspective uh, from us uh, for us. And as you see, she's also founder of the Mayors for Drinkable Meuse. So, Liam, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. 
Yes, so I'm um, very happy now that we are also in Amsterdam agreement, but to take uh, first a step back uh, of uh, why uh, a drinkable river, um, uh, as that is a, a, a first question, that um, uh, actually a river taught me that when I canoed it, uh, I learned that is actually normal um, to be able to drink from a river and um, um, and realize that actually our tap water is uh, quite genius and that that is quite utopian <laughs> that that we have realized and so how to return to a world with drinkable rivers um, has been uh, my personal and now also more societal uh, compass so it gives us a direction um, and um, uh, that, that that's why uh, drinkable rivers is uh, um, raising awareness and putting people to action to create a, a world again with drinkable rivers and uh, this walk yes yes just, yes. just wondering this is a wonderful picture by the way these are various mayors uh, 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 who work along the Meuse river right right yeah so um, the, the the drinkable river it, it, it resonated while walking the river Meuse the river that has fed me in my my, my youth uh, with drinking water and um, meeting all these mayors around seeing that the mayor is really the bridge between uh, the local people local actions and um, with the institutions and more regional um, um, ambitions yeah. uh, I thought if we are all connecting to each other we actually realize and acknowledge that we are all dependent on this one water body this one watershed and uh, that we are not only a mayor or a alderman of a, a city or town, but also of a part of the river. And uh, that's what we have now been uh, uh, start have started in 2019. This picture is in charleville mezières with um, uh, mayors from uh, the three countries, from uh, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And what we realized that if we, if all the relationships on the land are contributing, uh, the, and are in balance and, and, and in health, then we can realize a, a drinkable river. And for uh, making it formal of this uh, acknowledgement, we have a declaration that the mayors have signed. Here you see the, the three co-founder mayors uh, of charleville mezières Boris Ravillon, of Namur, Maxime Prévost, and of uh, Kuik, Wim Hillenaar. And uh, recently also Rotterdam has joined Okay. So, just just for, for, because this first part is about standards, why have you chosen uh, drinkable as a standard and not well swimmable will follow later or or some other, uh, well maybe more laboratorium type of standards that are more chemical maybe you've chosen drinkable. Why why did you choose that? Yeah, so th that was uh, due to that uh, first personal experience of that that is quite normal and that would be the most ambitious and that that is where we came from. So the swimmable, I think, is a very good uh, intermediate milestone, uh, So, uh, which it seems to resonate also with a lot of uh, the different cities, um, because that the relationship uh, for people to be able to swim, it, what we need is also the mobilization, not only of the institutions and professionals, but also of all the people with all their actions and how they clean themselves, how, do, how they garden. And so the, the, this is the most far uh, ambitious perspective that we would at least uh, um, cover all the water framework directive uh, goals that Hans was just uh, showing. Yeah. Um, and we are then collectively, because uh, it, it, it all, it, it needs that whole watershed yeah. of all those yeah. actions. And you're not focusing on the Meuse alone, right? It's, it's mayors for drinkable, uh, for rivers, uh, drinkable rivers is your, your sort of moonshot ambition. Uh, how do you focus on other rivers as well? How do you do that? Yeah, so drinkable rivers, I see it more as a whole societal uh, compass. And um, uh, now we have, uh, for instance, uh, also created mayors for drinkable rivers. So there, any city, town, village can join if they say, I would like to take on that ambition 
to at least work towards that direction. And that is, it's also not only about mayors and, and aldermen, it's anyone who wants to be um, joining in. It's actually a whole movement. So um, I'm also walking the River Isol this year. That's not transboundary, um, but I hope in the near future, the Thames and the Danube, for instance. So yes, it's more a call for all of us of a very simple indicator that Not hearing Lian at the moment. His um, image is freezed. Not sure what's happening now. Lian, are you with us again? Your image is I'm, frozen. I'm here again. Ah, okay, yeah. wonderful. Please continue and uh, some for some final remarks, please, because then we uh, we go on. To yeah, that, is, that it's a that it's a simple indicator that children understand as well. That's what I uh, wanted to uh, emphasize, so that yeah. we can't it can't be only a, a technical and expert approach. We need everyone in the watershed. Okay, um, I'd like to propose to uh, to uh, focus a bit more on the Amsterdam Agreement and the way you would like to uh, um, uh, uh, cooperate with the AIWW community uh, in order to really uh, uh, to make this a larger movement uh, during the discussion at the end of this part. Um, going on to the Seine River. Oh yeah, this is your. This is the the, the Amsterdam Agreement. It's just, just following the slides as well. Thank you, Quirin. There's also a book you've just written with uh, with Martin van der Schaaf. Uh, I think we have a slide on that as well, and it will soon uh, uh, be uh, be uh, available in English as well. Drinkable rivers, it says in Dutch. So uh, please be aware of the fact that that is available as well via the URL uh, below. So moving on, uh, let's go to uh, uh, to Bile Lafrit. We go to Paris. He's a water policy officer at the uh, Water Utility Organization for the Paris Urban Area, SIAAP Paris. Uh, welcome, uh, Bile. Great to have you with us. Hey, yeah, it's good. I will... ah, hi, there you are. Uh, so you're going to talk about the mission of the city of Paris to make the Seine swimmable again for the start of the Paris Olympics in 2024. That's a very uh, nice ambition and it's really recognizable from uh, my Waternet perspective because in Amsterdam we have the Amsterdam City Swim since 2011. Smaller city of course, smaller river, but still uh, a nice start if you ask me. So I hope you will be uh, successful in that respect as well. Uh, but please tell me, what are the main challenges to create a swimmable Seine from your part? Yeah, uh, so I, I okay. think like we can say that the two main challenges that we have in uh, in Paris to, to, to get to the bathing quality is actually are, are actually the same than the, those needed to get to the water framework directive. And so about the water framework directive, in fact, in the future bathing area, we have already reached uh, the water framework directive good status. So our problem about this, uh, this directive is really downstream. Yeah, so about the swimmable thing, it is really much more ambitious step far forward. And it is really, uh, the, we, for the bathing quality, we do need to have a zero default sanitation system. And for that, we need to tackle all non-point non sources problem. And those are especially the stormwater management because uh, there is a CSO's discharges. And also the run of water is also directly polluted with uh, fecal pathogens. And so the objective is definitely to reduce the imperviousness uh, of all the city. Uh, the other non-point uh, sources problem is the uh, misconnections because when on the separated systems, because wrong connections does lead to to, to discharge directly the, uh, the wastewater in the river. So the first challenge is to have this zero default sanitation. And so like the problems that we need to solve are the non-point sources problems, uh, it does bring another challenge. The one that needs, uh, we, we need to bring all the actors into action. I mean, like it's non-point sources problems, 
it does bring a lot of people that is involved in into all the action that we need yeah you've, you've uh, already mentioned the amount of partners you're uh, working on why is it important to have the joint mission and i can also imagine that the swimmable sand maybe attracts more partners and more enthusiasm than uh, 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 reporting or or uh, uh, being in line with the European directive. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's really funny to ask this question because, uh, I mean, it's really all about the work that is uh, going in uh, the Paris area. I mean, is how we can build uh, and share a joint vision uh, about all the water, actually, all the water in our cities. So it's really about... Um, Achieving a dream and the Olympics and the bathing legacy uh, made like a dream that everyone can go for it. I mean, so it's not really the drinkable uh, river like, like before. Uh, and it's still a huge booster. Uh, and, and since a few years, uh, we, we, we did try to to bring the sanitation on the top of the environmental agenda. And it has never happened. Uh, no one directly really cares about the, the water framework directive criteria uh, because it's, it's really technical and meaning, meaningless to, to, to all the people, uh, I mean, uh, out of the water field and definitely for the population and the politics. So with the bathing challenge, actually, the sanitation got, get, got on the top of the environmental agenda. And now we need to, to profit of this situation to change uh, the way we and, and all the actors and even the population see the water in the cities. Okay, so it's really a high priority now. On the final question, uh, I've understood and, and it makes perfect sense to not just uh, want to uh, make the Seine swimmable in 2024, but also in the future after 2024, keep that same quality. Um, uh, how are you going to do that? Because you then there's not just at one point in 2024 to work towards, but it's a longer term goal. How are you going to do that with all the partners involved? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's really about that because uh, I, I mean the main goal and what we defend is really not only about the Olympics in 2024, and it's really to keep that quality further and later and uh, also connected to the water framework directive. Uh, and like uh, the bathing quality is really harder than the water uh, framework directive, um, we, we definitely think, and that actually we know with various studies and things, uh, but if we answer the, the efforts needed for the bathing quality, we are. We will have made all the efforts needed for the water frame directive. And so, uh, when I'm talking about the bathing legacy, it's really about uh, living a dream, uh, a long-lasting dream, uh, for all the people, all the population, and thing. And okay. so, the long story will be that bathing legacy. Thanks a lot, below For now, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, go on to the Senegal River. Um, and um, I'd like to introduce Fauzi Bedredin, uh, Regional Project Coordinator of OMVS Senegal River, that's the river authority uh, in that area, and he's going to talk about the challenges uh, in, uh, well, having a clean ecosystem in the transboundary river. Uh, Fauzi, welcome uh, to this webinar. In what way does the Senegal River support the, all the users of the water from that particular river? Uh, how does it work in your area? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, I'm uh, Fauzi Bedredin, like you say. Uh, allow me first to, uh, first of all, to, to, to thank the organizers of this webinar for the invitation and the opportunity offered to me to share this experience of uh, Sahelian River Basin in a, the context of a climate change. For those who, do, who discover it, uh, this basin is shared by four countries. Guinea, Mali, Mauritania, and Senegal, with, which are the member states of the OMVS. So, uh, about uh, the public participation, uh, uh, can we move to the next uh, slide, please? Just uh, to, uh, to see the, the, 
the basin and now go to the next one. Yeah, about the public participation, um, uh, like uh, somebody is uh, now is, uh, sure here, we have in, uh, in OMVS, uh, our water charter adopted in uh, 2002. This uh, charters is in fact a part of the currently uh, dominant paradigm of the process of integrated water resource management. Uh, and uh, in this regard, it sets out three guiding principles that should govern and its intervention framework for the long term, namely the structuring and strengthening uh, of concerted management uh, involving in an iterative manner. All stakeholders in the basin are guarantee of its legitimacy. This first one. The second one is the inclusive approach to found a cooperation program necessary to the cross-border management of resources, because as you know, it's a transboundary uh, basin. And uh, the third one is action within strategic and participatory environmental framework for sustainable development of the Senegal River Basin. But in general, uh, the choice of actors relates to the actors who are directly concerned by local development in the basin. They bring together local communities, professional associations, cooperatives, uh, and also uh, the local non-governmental organization. And uh, all this with uh, also, we have uh, created uh, uh, last year's uh, a kind of user association complements this notional structure in the sense to the effectiveness of the participatory approach at the local level. There are basic structures created around specific corporations such as breeders, farmers, fishermen. So all uh, this uh, framework uh, we, for us is very important to involve uh, uh, these people, uh, this population in uh, our programs. Yes, of course, of course. Um, I've been told that uh, there's also this Diama Dam downstream of the Senegal River, the Diama Dam. What does it do and, and, yes. and in what way is it important? Uh, uh, for the river basin. Yeah, uh, next please, yes. This is a picture of uh, Jama Dam. Uh, so uh, like you see, the Jama Dam is, uh, is an anti-salt dam with uh, the main role of stopping the salty tongue during the period of low water. Before the dam, we had uh, uh, the salty water going 200 uh, kilometers into the, the land. So now with, the, with this dam, we, we, we have uh, the opportunity to uh, support three important aspects of the member states. First one is irrigated, irrigated agriculture, with now we have now, because of Dama Jam, uh, Jama Dam, uh, 1. 1, 120,000 hectares. And before the dam, it was only 10,000 hectares. So you can see the difference. Uh, the second one is supplying large cities with drinking water, like uh, Nouakchott, which is the capital of Mauritania, 1.2 people, 1.2 million people. Dakar also, capital of Senegal, uh, 4 million people. And uh, without forgetting most of the cities on the river. We have uh, all the cities on the river as uh, taking drinking water from the river. And the last but not least is restoration of wetlands with the national, we have two important national parks in the, in the Delta, which are uh, Jowling Park and uh, Jude Park. Okay. Uh, and we have two, uh, two big uh, wetlands uh, such as uh, Keys and Lac de Guerre. Okay, as a final question for now, what are the main obstacles for the OMVS, the organization uh, you work at? Yeah, as you know, uh, I, as I said before, the, the, this river is a Sahelian river. Can you move to the next uh, slide, please? Is the Sahelian River, and uh, you know, um, which with uh, some problems. Uh, and uh, I will talk about just two of these problems. We have uh, we have more than two, but uh, the two main problems. Is first one is uh, the proliferation of uh, aquatic plants. is uh, is a very good, a very a very big problem we, we are facing uh, in, uh, in in the in the delta of uh, Senegal River, because the commissioning of the Dama Jam was at the origin of profound changes, 
both in the level of life and activity of residents of the, of the river and in the natural environment strongly influenced by the new hydraulic conditions and stopping the salt intrusion. Uh, the prolonged and or permanent uh, presence of fresh uh, water upstream of, of Jama and their high temperature has created particularly favorable conditions for the rapid development of this uh, aquatic vegetation, and particularly uh, Tifa Australis on the bank of the rivers and in the main hydraulic cha hydraulics channels. And this uh, creates a big problem for uh, uh, socioeconomic activities like uh, agriculture, uh, fishing, and uh, also environmental. Yeah. And the second problem is, uh, is waterborne diseases like uh, malaria, like uh, some uh, uh, tropical diseases uh, we are facing like uh, malaria and uh, also bilergia. So we have some programs uh, developed by OMVS uh, uh, to uh, get a solution with, to these programs involving uh, for sure the population. Okay. Thanks a lot, Fazi. I'd, like uh, I'd like to leave it at this for the introduction. I'd like to invite the other uh, panelists in the discussion for the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, uh, that's going to end the, the first but, part about standards. And, um, uh, but, and but allow me, just, uh, just, just the last uh, slide. It's oh, important sorry. for me uh, just to invite all, uh, all ah. people. I, I invite all uh, people who are uh, attending this webinar. To, be, to get more involved in the preparatory process of the ninth World Water Forum, which will be organized next March in Dakar, Senegal. Thanks okay. a lot. Thanks for, uh, for uh, adding this to your introduction. Um, going to the discussion, um, I have two questions. Uh, thanks, Nupur. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask to first to Hans, and then we have uh, a bit of a, uh, some remarks about the Amsterdam agreements that were mentioned uh, at the um, uh, talk by uh, Liam. But first, uh, Hans, the Water Framework Directive is quite effective, but focused on the quality status of waters but it is mute on optimal water allocation by regulation, pricing, etc., between different potential users, although this is becoming extremely urgent, giving more drought, notably for the environmental users. Are there plans to enhance the directive in this way, or does the European Commission have other ideas? Thanks, Guy Allards, for your question. Hans, uh, can you comment on that? Maybe you've seen it in the chat, in the chat as well. Yeah, I, I saw it in the chat indeed. Um... The, the economic dimension of uh, water policy is, is super important and, and that's why there is an article in the directive uh, that uh, requires member states to make sure that they recover environmental and resource cost. Um, they're not all doing that. <laughs> uh, costs of uh, sanitation, etc., drinking water, that's usually recovered, but uh, costs of uh, other water pollution or water use, uh, such as uh, using the river for navigation or uh, using the water from river for, um, for, for irrigation, um, is usually less priced or, or is not really priced in the same way um, uh, as, as, uh, as these other uses that I mentioned. When it comes to allocation, I think we should also keep in mind that that's uh, everything to do with water quantity um, is a competence of the member states. And uh, that is something that is in the treaty. Um, the treaty says, the treaty of the European Union says that uh, everything related to water quantity is, um, is to be decided by unanimity, which is very exceptional in the environmental area. But that means that things like water transfers, for instance, between one river basin to the other, that's not something that we, um, that's not something that we would usually be looking at. No, for, for, for drought, uh, uh, that's evidently a problem uh, increasingly in Europe, really not limited to the South anymore. I mean, where I live in Flanders, uh, that is one of the driest uh, areas of, of yeah. Europe, uh, believe it or not. Um, okay. and, uh, and, 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 and drought policies are, are absolutely necessary at, at that scale. Um, we, we try to promote that also at the European level, but I, for, for drought policy, I, I personally believe that there is a very 
important responsibility for the member states also to take coordinating measures in any case to take the right measures in terms of urban planning to avoid okay. that so it's not going uh, to be part the of the water framework to be covered with uh, with concrete and, and and pavement and all of that so um okay I thanks think a lot for now of, uh, of approaches we need there thanks uh, next question for Bilal. How will nature-based solutions help Paris reach their goals? Thanks, Oscar Alvarado, for your question. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the NBS actually has the best solution to, 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 to manage the stormwater, uh, actually, at least for the little rain, like uh, at least the first millimeters uh, of, of the rain. And in, in the world area, we are developing a lot of uh, MBS because it's, it's also uh, definitely uh, particip participating to the adaptation to the climate, uh, climate change. Uh, that's all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the final minutes of this discussion, I'd like to invite Leon uh, back on uh, stage. We've talked about the Amsterdam Agreement, and I forgot to mention earlier that all three rivers uh, have signed an uh, Amsterdam Agreement uh, with the AIWW, and that uh, really opens up uh, opportunities to share in the community and to see what the best practices can be uh, can be exchanged. And, and I'm wondering how Leon is planning to use that Amsterdam Agreement to uh, to uh, reach her uh, her ambitious goals, Leon. Yeah, so uh, besides the water basin uh, agreement uh, with the Meuse, we uh, have now, we welcome uh, other towns, cities, villages around the world. If they also feel um, this might resonate to have the drinkable river as their um, compass uh, to mobilize uh, their people um, and have that as a direction, then uh, to, to join us, um, uh, the how and what, uh, I think would be good to go more in depth to see what that would entail, but it mainly is about that we learn from each other uh, to exchange our local actions and what it takes to have that direction and the long-term perspective as part of your um, um, strategy of the city. Okay, so that's also an invitation to the other two rivers uh, uh, here in this uh, session and maybe also to people uh, attending this uh, webinar uh, if they would like to join you in that uh, mission uh, towards drinkable rivers. Yeah, it would be really great as a start, for instance, to continue to talk uh, and meet uh, uh, Bilal's uh, uh, initiative uh, to see how the long-term uh, goal of uh, the swimmable river um, and that that could be actually a milestone uh, before reaching the Towards. drinkable river. Yeah. So I think we could really synergize that that initiatives, those initiatives, and welcome other uh, cities around the world because there are already cities where they are swimming and where it's possible. Uh, so we can learn from from those and uh, inspire others to join. Yeah. 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 Sounds good, Bilal. What do you think uh, from a San and Paris perspective? An open yeah, yeah, invitation, no strings attached, but an invitation to maybe uh, talk further and see uh, where you can help each other out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, the, the, the more we are in, the more uh, we can have a success about all, uh, all, all, this, all those strategies. I mean, uh, even if uh, we, have, we can have uh, on some parts uh, some priorities and things, um, the, the big thing is really about changing the, the, the water management. Actually, what we did for a long time wasn't really efficient about all the, the nature and biodiversity and climate change and things. And now we have kind of a, an opportunity to change and to get a lot of benefits. And each one will be, I don't know, uh, thinking about one benefit maybe. And if we are together, we can all profit about all that, all of that. And I'd like, yeah. uh, if I can uh, uh, add to that, to really mobilize people to join us and not only uh, uh, in, in the say, water management, but really uh, have people feel that they, they are part of this as well. 
Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Maybe on a final note for this discussion, Leon, I'm wondering how do you look at the sort of the interaction between uh, framework directives coming from the uh, European Union, really legislation, and sort of the more bottom up, uh, yeah, including people living in in river basins, uh, and 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 the, the the dynamics that that brings about. How do you feel? Does it support each other, or is one yeah, uh, working better than the other? Can you uh, uh, can yeah. you uh, reflect on that? Yeah, prior to the walk, the thousand kilometer walk along the Meuse, I was quite uh, skeptical about those frameworks. I thought that's a lot of paperwork uh, and talks, but actually I really saw on the local level how that framework is really put into practice and, and taken serious. And I'm very proud now that we have these ambitious uh, frameworks. Um, but now it is, and how to really realize it, what what Hans was just saying, that less than 50% of that state is, is in, in a, a bad uh, state. So there's a lot of uh, um, work to do. And so I think if we can connect that to what we dream of and what we find beautiful and uh, what we treasure, uh, then those go, th those frameworks and the bottom-up uh, can uh, really strengthen each other. Okay. Okay, so they really work from different perspectives, but they can really uh, strengthen each other. Thanks a lot uh, for now. That's the end of the first part. I just got a new question, but I think I'll leave that for the discussion at the end of the second part. So I go back to our uh, program, part two, ecosystem balance challenges and good practices. I've introduced it shortly uh, before. We have Stuart Orr with us. He's practice lead freshwater at the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. Uh, international and uh, he's uh, introducing the um, ecological perspective and later on is joining Eric Roesink, uh, founder and CTO of NX Filtration and also Professor Advanced Membranes, uh, membranes uh, at the uh, University of Twente in the Netherlands and he will introduce the technological perspective. But we first uh, like to start with Stuart. Uh, Stuart, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very uh, much. Yes, we've uh, had a brief introduction uh, earlier this week and you said, well, I'd just like to uh, first hear what the other speakers uh, have said and, and, and give some first comments on what you've heard so far. But, so that would be my first question, really, um, uh, before we have some other stuff coming uh, at you. But, but maybe could you please uh, reflect on what you've heard, uh, the different perspectives, legislative and, and, and the more bottom up approaches uh, that we've talked about? Yeah, very good. I really enjoyed the first speakers uh, and I appreciate everything that they're trying to do. I think that um, the, obviously the messages resonate with us, not just in Europe, but across the world. I think the state of the world's rivers and uh, freshwater ecosystems are, are not great. Um, and I think the clearest indication of that is the uh, fall of freshwater biodiversity. 83% loss of abundance of species since 1970. It's the greatest impact in the globe. Um, and when your freshwater biodiversity is, is crashing, you're, you know that the systems that they uh, live in are crashing. So river health, yes, is drinkable and swimmable, is all the things that we care about. But good river health also needs to sustain uh, ecological status. It needs to be able to um, maintain uh, biodiversity and communities of species. But of course, rivers are also delivering much more than just water for people. They're delivering sediment to deltas and to agriculture. They're providing nutrients. They're providing uh, freshwater fish. In fact, freshwater fish are the primary source of protein for 200 million people on this planet. So I heard some great things today. I think uh, Leanne has reminded us that water doesn't come from a tap, it comes from ecosystems. And that's always good to remind people. And I think taking anyone on that journey along river systems to tell them the importance is extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, we've done a number of journeys of water ourselves in many countries around the world, and we found them to be extremely powerful ways. Uh, I love the idea of swimming in Paris. I look forward to it next time I get there. Um, I'd love to see sturgeon swimming in the Seine, actually. Uh, and in fact, when you walk across the Pont Neuf, if you take a good look at the statues, you'll see a massive sturgeon sticking out from these statues. But unfortunately, sturgeon is the most threatened animal species on the planet today. And that's worth remembering for people on the call. The most threatened animal species on the planet is in European rivers, and that's the sturgeon. So let's bring the sturgeon back. Um, but I think the challenge for all of us is, uh, you know, we've just come through World Water Day where the theme has been valuing water. And I, I think that that's great, but I think we need to expand that to valuing rivers. I mean, I think that we need to open up this bigger conversation as we talk about climate adaptation, nature-based solutions, resilience, all of these things that are ex exceedingly important for the global community. 
freshwater and freshwater ecosystems, rivers and wetlands are going to be absolutely central to how we manage that going forward. So this greater focus on the value of these systems, I think, is extremely valuable. Um, and I think the challenge for all of us is to incentivize the investors, the companies, the regulators um, to start to work with us to make sure that these are valued properly. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, bringing in mind the, the, uh, the, the Water Framework Directive and, and Hans' comments about it being a, a good le legislation in itself, but implementation is, 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 well, yeah. is lacking in a way. Uh, what is your perspective on what can we do to make uh, implementation work better? And, and do we have to be more uh, rigid or, or, or uh, uh, well, uh, well uh, giving out fines to governments who, who don't right. do their job? Or what can, can be done there? I think, uh, well, first of all, I thought uh, the presentation was great. I think that the fact that the framework directive is, is fit for purpose is, is exactly right. It's extremely progressive legislation. Um, and obviously implementation is, is difficult. I think it's carrot and stick. I think we do need to punish some people along the way, but I do think that we need to get better on the incentives. Um, there is so much finance in Europe. The idea that we still have urban areas where sewerage is a problem or that companies aren't Alliance for Water Stewardship certified, or that we can't build regulations that are more than just preventing harm, but are also incentivizing good, uh, good rewards or rewarding companies and uh, municipalities that are doing well uh, in regulatory or tax ways. I think there's so many things that we could be doing to incentivize good and bad across not just Europe, but the world. And I hear all the time from investors that there's great money, uh, lots of money there to invest. I think we need to be the ones to put together um, the bankable and the smart investments, uh, whether that's around nature-based solutions or clean tech. Um, to be quite frank, I think that we need to just, we need to be spending a lot more time on really incentivizing opportunity as opposed to punishing people. Yeah, yeah. Um, your first comment was about, uh, uh, well, it's all nice to have these swimmable and drinkable rivers, and it's very important, but it also should support biodiversity. Do you yeah. feel the current standards or the current ideas or initiatives support biodiversity enough? Uh, I think they try very hard. I think the framework directive tries very hard. Um, I think the, the reasons for biodiversity decline across Europe are mostly down to fragmentation of our rivers. Uh, the connectivity issue is, is extreme. Um, I think there's obvious water quality challenges as well. Um, but I think that the connectivity issue is the one that we have to address. Um, there's a great effort to try and reconnect rivers and rethink about where we need to put our hydro dams, if we need them at all. In fact, I don't think we do need them anymore in Europe, to be quite frank. We need to be thinking very innovatively about, again, getting to my point, people have lost their way in understanding how important rivers and, and freshwater ecosystems are in our economies and our lives. And we can't talk about wanting to address climate change and continue to think that we can dam and block and, and destroy our river systems and, and face those challenges. We simply can't. Yep. And, and certainly in the developing world, you can't meet the SDGs if we destroy uh, our ecosystems. We just can't do it. Yeah, but still, that's maybe a very superficial remark from my side, but if I uh, recall uh, Fauzi's uh, presentation about the dam and the good that it's bringing there, how do, how do you look at uh, that dam if you uh, uh, link it with your previous remark? Yeah, well, I think, well, I think it, depends on, it depends what what you're trying to do, right? I mean, dams are extremely important in many economies for water storage and energy generation. I think that as Fauzi demonstrated, it's been an important uh, intervention in their case for saltwater intrusion. I don't think that's my point. My point is that there's a lot of um, obsolete structures in our river systems that need to come out. And I think where they are obsolete or where, they, where, or where the energy generation is negligible, Let's be smart and start to reconnect our systems in a more holistic way. It, there's undoubtedly need for infrastructure and in rivers around this world for many different reasons. And I think Fauzi gave a great example, but I think we also need to be extremely smart about when we do this, why we do this and what the alternatives are. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Stuart. Um, just looking at my... Uh... Smartphone, I have all these uh, devices around me, uh, making sure we have, uh, we're going uh, right with the program. But I think uh, for now it's time to invite Eric on and we have a final discussion, Stuart, uh, with you and Eric later on, but thanks for now. Eric, uh, please join us. Uh, I shortly introduced you already. You're uh, introducing the technological perspective. So great to have you with us, uh, uh, founder and CTO of NX Filtration and professor at advanced membranes at the University of Twente. Uh, first focusing on maybe on that NX Filtration, could you please enlighten us of what you're uh, doing there? 
Yeah, thank you um, for this introduction. Yes, um, I, I, I'm supposed to, to highlight the technology perspective and NX Filtration is a company who is uh, offering uh, what we could call a breakthrough solution to, uh, to deal with, um, uh, with all kinds of wastewater streams. Uh, th that means our, our, our technology based on membranes and new generation of membranes can, for example, be applied in further improving the quality of our sewage water treatment systems. Uh, but also, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and also inspired by, by the stories that, that we are aiming for drinkable and, and uh, swimmable waters. But okay, unfortunately, there are many rivers in the world uh, where also our technology is very welcome to make uh, drinking water based out of non-swimmable and non-drinkable waters. Unfortunately, so the, the situation in the world is that there's a lot of drinking water. Of, uh, sorry, rivers is not yet drinkable. So that that that's where I'm coming from. This this technology perspective and where we have a very nice uh, technology solution, uh, which is also recently applied as the breakthrough technology of the year for this this application. But if you allow me, um, um, what what I also where we developed it. What was my inspiration? Uh, Yep. After I left my, my former job, that was the enormous amount of presence of toxic chemicals like micropollutants, residual medicines, uh, the PFAS uh, uh, in, in our wastewater treatment plants, which are not treated uh, properly with these systems, but are disposed then typically in rivers and, and ending up by the sea. And, and uh, these wastewater treatment systems in, in, in which we are, which are developed to remove nitrogen phosphorus, so the night nutrients are not designed to remove this toxic compound, which we find more and more, unfortunately, in the, in the environment. And, and then I'm also coming back to, uh, to, to Hans, to Hans Tilstra on the, on, on the water frame directive. It's an impressive program, absolutely agree. But in my opinion, we might be a bit more strict on this subject in, in, in dealing with how we, de uh, how we, we judge the, the effluent uh, treatment, which is not properly uh, free of a lot of toxic compounds. We can do that technology. So there is a technology which is able to do so, create therewith uh, the swimmable and even drinkable waters. And, 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 and if you're not in the situation uh, that you want to give back all the treated water back to the nature, uh, you can use it. You can reuse it for even for drinking water and you can even reuse it for all kinds of other applications. And that means, and, and then uh, also to stimulate Hans, uh, because I think to know that they are a little bit reluctant to make the regulations too strict to not further drive the cost of municipalities or not drive further the cost of industries. With this technology, you can reuse your water. And since water has a value, which is a very important statement, I think, uh, you can even have an economic feasible and attractive situation by using technology, which also then again stimulates by companies like NX Filtration and competitors to, to further develop and to further improve this technology. So you create a whole, say, very useful, sustainable industry, which also is an important, uh, yeah, creating a machine for jobs. Uh, so also the Unip European Committee should, should, should think of that, that mechanism, which we also see in the in the world of the energy transition where windmills and pol uh, solar energy and not only give sustainable energy, but also create jobs and, 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 and stimulate a sustainable uh, energy uh, technology platform and industry for the future. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've seen on your website uh, 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 that you, the, your first um, the, the technology is, is already implemented in a sewage uh, a wastewater treatment uh, um, uh, site in the Netherlands, in the Twente yeah. area, I, uh, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, do you foresee, if uh, entrepreneurs are always uh, ambitious and optimistic people, of course, uh, Absolutely. how do you look at the near future? Is, is, what challenges do you see ahead of you, uh, speaking about an exfiltration, to, uh, to see more implementations uh, coming your way? Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm, I'm, as it's good you mentioned that I'm uh, in the nature, I'm an optimistic. That's why I'm an entrepreneur six days a week and, and one day a professor and the other day. Um, but indeed, we are demonstrating this technology in the Netherlands, but also in other parts of the world. And, and, um, and, and I think that uh, I'm sure that with, with more strict regulation, because I know that the water utilities are awaiting, awaiting regulation. So there's a balance between implementation and, and legislation. So I want to give that message very clearly to Hans. Uh, but at the other hand, uh, he might be lucky, uh, which is sounds a little bit uh, 
uh, sarcastic because that's also what was brought up by Hans himself. We get more and more droughts. And uh, even Flanders and even the Netherlands, we see that it's getting dry and drier every summer. I think it's five years in a row that in our area, where Hans and I'm living, the, the summer is getting... Uh, and that means that there's a big need for, uh, for, for drinking water sources. Uh, traditionally, the first uh, source is groundwater that's considered to be clean and, and safe and reliable. Also, there we get some issues, but we see also that to, due to the lack of rainfall, the ground, groundwater is going down, it's going down. And therefore, also in our country, yeah, like in Enschede and, 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 and in Belgium, I think we, it's not far away that we are uh, coming to the situation that we're more or less forced to reuse, you reuse the, the, the wastewater from, from, from sewage treatment systems for all kinds of applications, perhaps first the industrial to save drinking water, but then also direct to drinking water. And I think also Hans is aware that the European Committee is also heavily stimulating the reuse of effluent, and not only the municipal effluent, but also the industrial effluent. But I think, um, I'm honestly, second. sorry? Yeah. No, no, that's, that's what, that what, what was, was my next question was going to be, because from a waternet perspective, we're quite ambitious on the circular economy as well. And I was wondering if your technology also supports the reuse of, uh, of, uh, of certain nutrition and, and other uh, um, uh, well, uh, stuff that, that's being uh, found in effluence. Yeah, yeah, I think the most important product we recover is water. Uh, that's often forgotten for uh, a municipality. Uh, there is an, uh, certainly in the Netherlands with uh, all kinds of activities, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of focus on the recovery of nutrients. Very uh, uh, well accepted, and I, I w heavily support that. But I, I keep on promoting the fact that water is the most important raw material of of of, uh, of an effluent treatment system. And and yes, we are uh, participating in several of these projects yeah, because if you if you take, for example, our so-called non Uh, you reject and uh, retain all kind of phosphorus uh, compounds, and, and then you have a high concentration of phosphorus in your in your so-called concentrate stream, and that allows you then to recover the phosphorus at, at a more efficient way as you do it from the full diluted stream. That's one of example. Okay. We do that, for example, in snake in the Netherlands. Yeah. And, yeah. and and yes, that's certainly important. But again, take my message: the water is very far, far out the most important raw material you yeah. can recover yeah. from an effluent system. Final question be, before I uh, uh, invite Stuart back in for the final discussion. Also, I'd like to invite uh, the attendees of the webinar to uh, pose some final questions if they uh, have any. Um, uh, Stuart just mentioned the, the, the investment side, is, uh, the, making the remark that we need far more investments. Uh, uh, and also Hans highlighted that in his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, how do you look at it from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective? Do you see there's a, there's enough investments in technology like yourselves? And you mentioned also some competitors being around. Uh, is there enough money around to support the, well, the, 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 the development you need to, uh, to take your technology to, uh, to higher levels? Yeah, if, if you allow me, I make a distinction then or uh, Difference between uh, the municipalities and and the industry. Yes, of in course, the in that's true. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. There's a very important difference because in industry, yeah, I'm I'm working with the bigger with the blue chip companies like Pepsi or Cola or, or whatever, and these already are very. They these guys or these companies do realize that water is very important. So they invest in reuse, they invest in, in the water footprint, uh, et cetera. They want to be an ESG company and et cetera. So uh, there, there is money available. And also they have learned that once you have invested in water reuse, it's also economic uh, effective. So it's, it's profitable. Uh, municipalities is, is, could be an issue. And I think also that's the reason Europe, Europe is a little bit hesitating uh, because then you drive up the costs for first for the, for the people, so tax increase, uh, but also, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, as an example, which is supposed to have the highest quality of drinking water worldwide and European-wide uh, at the top. And there's also, you see, and, and you're from Waternet, uh, but the, 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 water you, uh, the, the, the drinking water utilities are lacking uh, the, the capital and, and the financial ratios to, to come with further investments uh, to keep out the, the micropollutants and the issue of medicine from the water schemes, depending on where your water scheme is. So I think we have also to be creative together with Europe uh, to, 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 to perhaps even the banks should, 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 should play a role here in, in helping yeah. out our, our water utilities. But yeah. in the industry, there is, there is a very strong drive worldwide to reuse water. And, and, and we see also that um, um, 
that the municipalities, so the, the water boards in the Netherlands, so they're taking care of the wastewater or the drinking water companies, they do want to invest. But I think there, there might be a chance that there is some, 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 some capital issues, uh, financial ratios, which are heavily under discussion in these companies. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stuart, maybe if I can invite you back in the discussion. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, we, we talked about the carrot and the stick. We've talked about the legal uh, ways of, of, of uh, making progress. We have uh, talked about behavioral stuff, uh, doing things differently. Uh, uh, but there's also this technological perspective. How do you, uh, well, there's just not this sort of final judgment of what's going to work. Of course, it's, it's, it's a balance and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and working uh, together. But uh, how do you value that technological uh, progress? Do you see there's big breakthroughs coming or is it just uh, maybe a smaller part of, of maybe more of a legal or a behavioral uh, aspect? No, I see massive. I mean, I think that the innovation in the water sector and the, on the uh, technical side and, and the work that Eric was just describing is, is growing. I mean, all the time. I'm, I'm constantly approached by startups or companies that have new technologies or or, or new finance, and, and I'm trying to keep pace with all the new uh, the switch into the digital uh, water, which I have to admit is, uh, is, is quite confusing at times. But I think there's a lot of innovation in the water sector. And I, I think that technology is gonna be very, very important. But at the end of the day, if you look at these large river systems um, and we look at what we need to protect them as a whole for all the multiple needs that we draw on them for, uh, we're going to need more than technology, and I think I think what I'm, I think at the same time, while I'm seeing a lot of investment and opportunity in in technology, I'm seeing a complete lack of investment in institutions and governance and the things that are really going to matter um, at the at the macro level. So um, mm -hmm. I think we need to see more investment on that side as well. Thank you, thank you. I'm just. Uh, uh, but may I make a comment yes, on please. that? Uh, yeah. um, um, uh, what Stuart said, I, I, I agree, but I think technology can be important in combination with regulation. I think uh, for, for the, 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 our, our friends uh, Bilal and, 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 and the end from the swimmable, swimmable and drinking water, I think they realize that the Meuse and the Rhine, for example, in, and, and let's stick to the Meuse, which is very appealing for Leon, in the summer contains 60 to 70 percent treated effluent. Uh, that, that, that means that indeed, if you do something with uh, an extra step in treating effluent, it should, in my opinion, have an enormous impact on the quality of the river. Uh, as we know in, in, in the Netherlands in the summer, uh, in uh, uh, Brabant and Limburg, the, our two, two southern province, they, they, they sometimes really have to stop taking in water from the Meuse as a source for drinking water because the concentration of pollutants in this, is in this dry summer so high okay. that they have to wait till they get uh, again some, some rain and, and, and more dilution of it. So in my opinion, in think, say, certainly if we, we look to the, to, the, to the Rhine and the river, if we do something with this effluent treatment, we really could make a huge step in cleaning up these rivers and, 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 and achieving the goal from us all, make it swimmable, better make it drinkable. Thanks. I'd like to go to uh, Lian. Uh, um, maybe first question, um, tying back to Eric's uh, remark, how do you see that? Uh, do you also agree on that um, uh, technological uh, uh, part of the solution for the Meuse? And uh, after that, I have another question about citizen science. But first, a technological perspective, please. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm aware of that. And uh, so that is... Uh, um, a good, uh, I think, te temporary step that if it gets, it lands with all the people and all our habits in how we make our choices in our daily life. Um, and that means also our whole sewage system that actually all our nutrients can also maybe help um, maybe work on the ground and the soil and, and, and because that's where it's maybe needed as well. So to really reinvent that, but as a temporary step, it's very important, yeah, especially also with all the me medicine residues um, that we, um, um, yeah. That it's close in the water. water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks. I'm just uh, getting back to the uh, question by Suzanne Loon uh, that was previously answered by Bilal. Thanks a lot. And Lian also uh, uh, um, uh, uh, responded to that. But you also mentioned citizen science. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit on what role citizen science can play in, in uh, well, giving more agency to people living around rivers. 
Yeah, so I, be, I believe in experience, love, care. When we experience our rivers again, we will start to understand the importance and, and feel that our love will grow and we'll take actions and care again. And one way to experience our rivers again is by researching and monitoring the, ourselves and that we then um, make a, like a, an, a, a first measurement um, at where we can compare the next measurement with and so that we can see what direction are we going are we deteriorating or are we improving it are we going towards a drinkable river or not um so that is a very concrete way of um yeah engaging uh, people and um and showing how the both the chemical and uh, ecological components are part of that yeah. that actually that is what helps emerging uh, quality as uh, drinkability and are people easily uh, um, uh, drawn into that citizen science? Do they easily participate, yeah. in your opinion? Well, uh, it's very nice that after the Meuse walk there, I did a measurement every uh, day, and that's a big river. Of course, it's very uh, important also in the small uh, river, uh, the, the, the tributaries to, to measure. And for instance, on the 28th of May, um, this year, we um, uh, have done a call for the whole of the Netherlands, at least now, for to join primary schools, and we have 150 schools signed up. Um, and so, and we've also now 30 organizations around Europe, which we hope to broaden soon as well. So there seems a, a lot of enthusiasm, both from an educational perspective or from making actions more concrete. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, final call for everybody who wants to uh, um, uh, ask a question to our uh, panelists. I'm enjoying the, if I speak for myself, I'm enjoying the discussion uh, a lot. Uh, we have some final minutes before I uh, close uh, the webinar. Um, and maybe this is also the time to say that we leave the chat function open for another 15 minutes after quarter past uh, four so it will be open until half past uh, four for people to connect in an online environment so that's well basically the networking part of a, of a, of a sort of an old-fashioned offline webinar but then uh, in the chat function so uh, uh, be aware of that if you have the time please join us for um, for that online networking just checking the q a in the chat Um, are there examples in England where the water in rivers is clean enough to drink? Tayo asks that. Anyone has information on that? In England? Yes, in England. I don't think so. I think, uh, in fact, I saw a tweet today from the Rivers Trust in the UK, and I think the UK's rivers are particularly in bad shape. Um, and I think rated against French rivers, there's only one bathing river, bathing status river in the UK or something. So. I, I, the answer to that is probably no. <laughs> okay, yeah. So there's a lot of, so Tayo, if you, uh, uh, there's, there's a, a world to be gained in that respect. So uh, if we look at it from the positive side, um, I think this is us uh, for the moment, going to my uh, final remarks. Uh, first of all, of course, thanks a lot for joining this webinar to all attendees, but especially of course to our panelists. Thanks a lot for your remarks, presentations and, uh, and insights. Um, well, I think, um, well, as uh, discussions go, it's, it's been broad and wide enough to, uh, of the two broad and wide to summarize it to, with a few simple bullet points. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say that we are, uh, because also we've re recorded it, we'll be able to, uh, to take out the good points and the best practices and take it all with us towards the Amsterdam International Water Week taking place from 1 till 5 November, as I mentioned earlier. Um, let's take a look at the next webinar. We have a series of four, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the uh, next one coming up on April 30, same time, three o'clock starting and 4.15 uh, uh, will it end. Water solutions number two about reuse, recycle and um, recover. It's all about the reclaim and reuse of wastewater. So that also ties into Eric, uh, Eric's remark uh, made earlier. And edition three and four will take place in end of May and end of June. So if your agenda is free, please join us for those webinars all the time, <clears throat> each, each edition starting at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, the next 50 minutes will be able, well, yes, and of course, this is where it all leads to, this save the date for the Amsterdam International Water. Well, I've been saying week, it used to be week, now it's web, but AIWW uh, from one to five November. 
plenty of opportunity to connect and act to make water work. So please join us there. Um, next 50 minutes, chat will stay open for some online networking. Um, so if you, uh, and if you have some final, maybe one-on-one -on -one questions for our panelists, that's your uh, uh, um, uh, possibility there, a final remark. Um, sorry, Hans mentioned that the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive will be revised, it seems. Oh, that's a final question. Ooh, do we have time for that? Uh, well, maybe for the final minute, Hans, if you're still uh, with us. Um, it seems that the technical possibilities for further reducing pollutants in the emissions should be taken into account to establish more stringent standards, standards to the effluents being emitted to the streams. A question from Ursula. Not sure if we can squeeze it into the final minute, uh, Hans. Well, I can, I, I can just confirm that indeed the plan is to revise it uh, in, and, and to look at the technological possibilities. But uh, as uh, Mr. Rusink will, I'm sure, uh, appreciate. Uh, but we also need to take care of the issue of affordability. Uh, so whatever we... Uh, try and regulate at European level uh, should be doable in uh, in the in the rich parts of Europe and in the poor parts of Europe. So we will properly impact assess uh, all these ideas and uh, we will come up with a with a proposal in 2022. Um, but uh, yeah, we need to strike a balance there between what is technically possible and what is uh, affordable and provides. Uh, um benefits for for society of course sorry that's Hans a very general answer that uh, uh that's probably as much as we can do in this one minute perhaps hans and if you allow me the the first big successes with our technology we had not in europe but we had it in indonesia and in vietnam and in the philippines not typically countries where what you could call a refer to as the most rich countries in the world and, and that's because the technology was that sufficient efficient and, and chemical free and sustainable and affordable water was produced so yes mm. it can be affordable okay. but that leads that what how do you judge and how do you value the, the the water which comes out of your effluent stream and that's one of the issues it until now it's always considered to be as waste and and we think with this technology you can transfer it in a high quality even drinking water and then back to also Stuart and, 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 and Leon, even giving clean water back to the river is also value, creating value. But it's an, a value which it's not ex, uh, economically recognized, but it's very important for the future. And I think that's what we all agree upon. Well, perhaps we should stop calling it uh, wastewater, urban wastewater. Absolutely, perhaps, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Begin to call it uh, an urban resource. Uh, absolutely. Or something like that. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks Sorry, a lot, yeah. Hans and Eric, for these uh, final remarks, and thanks, Ursula, for your question. Thanks uh, once more. Thanks a lot on behalf of the AIWW team for uh, joining us, and I hope to see you at some of the next uh, webinars. Um, and the chat is open for the next 50 minutes for some online networking. That's it for now. Thank you.